you know, property management is the wild west. I mean, there's always crazy <laughs> stuff happening. And in this particular asset class, yeah, you got you to have a, a really good, strong property management team to manage these kind of assets. It's Adam Schrader here with another episode, and I am joined today by Sydney. She is the Vice President of Finance at Open Door Capital, and we are going to talk about the exciting world of managing your uh, commercial investments that you're a part of. So, Sydney, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So let's just start with the, the general question of where, when did you get into real estate? What got you here? Why did you stick around? Oh, wow. Um, I was in the, uh, the W2 rat race, the um, super stressful job. I was finance and accounting and um, I just realized I was making a lot of people a lot of money and <laughs> not really myself. And I was well, really- people wasn't you? Yeah, those people was not me. And um, I just really was looking for just uh, the ability to have freedom. And I was really trying to find that that thing that would allow me to have my work and my life be together as one life, as opposed to this uh, employee concept of I have my work and then when I'm done working, then I can go live my life that I like to do. So I was trying to find that thing where I could say, I just want to live my life and I enjoy work so much that it's just part of my life. So I, I just kind of started out with that mindset and, you know, real estate, I've always been interested. Even as a kid, I remember being interested in real estate for some reason. I'm not sure. I feel like a lot of real estate people are like that. You know, there's just something about the ground, you know, the land that's, uh, you can touch it, you know, feel it, see it. Um, so I just plugged in and when I, when I started, when I, when I was getting started, it was 2018 and everybody was so hot on multifamily and, um, you know, everyone's like, you got to go big, you got to, you know, don't, you know, everyone's like, go big, don't do, you know, a, a single family home and all this stuff. And you know, I'm, I'm hearing all these people say these different things. And I was like, well, okay, all right, I'm going to go big. Everyone's doing multifamily. So, um, I don't hear anyone talking about mobile home parks, you know, to me, that's multifamily, but people are not talking about that. And I can see kind of the affordable housing thing being a theme in the future. So I was like, I think I'm going to learn about this and just become an expert. And I just, from that day, just titled myself mobile home park expert, even though I knew nothing about it. <laughs> and then it just, it just went from there. Um, so my first deal took me about a year to get, but my first deal was a 71 unit mobile home park in Indiana, which has been uh, a wonderful property. I'm, I'm so appreciative of it. I still have it today. Um, and then from there, the rest is history. I joined Open Door Capital. Um, I live in mobile home park land every day. It's awesome. I love what I do. Yeah, so, so I didn't quite catch. What year did you start your first mobile home park investment? I start. I my, I purchased my first property at the end of 2019. Okay. But I started, you know, I decided yeah. I was going to do it the year prior. So it okay. took me a while to kind of understand this whole real estate thing and how everything works and kind of plug in with the right people and uh, get my mindset yeah. right to pull off something like that. So yeah. So since then, there's been a whole lot of you know. I've heard a lot about and people have been researching a lot into mobile home parks. And I know y'all do self storage facilities as well. Um, you're obviously doing kind of apartment buildings. How is that sector going right now in the real estate market? Because, you know, people hear you hear talk about what certain markets are doing and crash this, maybe not crash that. And it's very dependent on the asset class, the area that you're in, obviously. But when it comes to like mobile home parks, and self-storage, have those been impacted much at all during um, this current economic climate we're in? I cannot speak to self-storage because we haven't actually pulled the trigger on self-storage yet. Right. That's kind of on our vision board for this year on how we want to jump into that space. So to be determined on that. But um, as far as the mobile home parks go, we haven't really seen any kind of dip, um, you know, that's economy related, you know, we're, we're in the affordable housing space. So 
you know, theoretically, you're kind of in that, that safe space where, you know, people can always move down, you know, you can always go from class A to class B to class C to class D or whatever. Um, so we haven't, we haven't really seen, um, you know, too many issues with being in the, in, in the mobile home park space. You know, we do have a lot of people on assistance, which helps um, to kind of get those checks. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And so speaking of, you know, you having the mobile home park, y'all doing kind of the multifamily sector, how did you go about as you bought your mobile home park and as y'all have been doing this as your fund, actively managing those things? Because I'm assuming you didn't buy your first mobile home park and go around and knock on, you know, 70 some odd doors and say, you know, where's your money for this month? So how, how did you go about structuring that management side of it? Um, for, for the deal that I did, for, so for my first deal, um, I learned quickly, you cannot do it by yourself. So I just started networking and just getting to know as many people as I could. And one of the people that I found uh, that I partnered with was a property manager who lives, you know, pretty close to the property. So I was like, okay, I, I kind of got this piece figured out. I'll give him a part of the deal. So he'll have skin in the game and he'll get, you know, PM fees. And then I can just kind of let that part, you know, run itself and be a, a lot more passive so that I could focus more on, you know, the bird's eye view of it, the asset management aspect of it. Um, so, yeah, I just, you know, you just have to kind of find different people to plug into the equation to, to get there. Um, as far as, you know, being with Open Door Capital, the reason we've been able to scale the way we have is uh, it sounds so cheesy and I even hate saying it, but it's really the people and the team that we've created. Um, I, I just cannot tell you guys, like we have like the secret sauce. It's um, our, our ability to communicate. Uh, we have core values that we are obsessed with, that we live by, we measure each other by. And those have just seemed to be our secret sauce to just um, working together uh, towards relentless improvement and just skyrocketing to the moon. We've, uh, we're right now at um, about 7,900 units of which, uh, what do we got? 5,500 are mobile home park units. So um, yeah, <laughs> super excited. <laughs> So what's the key to, to managing that? I mean, 5,500 um, doors that you're having to deal with the management on, like what are some of the big things y'all look at? Because, you know, you did find um, the person to help you manage your, your one that you own personally, which is great, but how I'm assuming that not every single person you've initially partnered with has been a fantastic property management group. Who's, you know, done everything you could possibly dream of. There's obviously been some bumps in the road. So what are some of the things y'all have learned about, actively managing the, these investments to help you achieve the ROI that you're looking to, to get? Hmm. Well, in, in the mobile home park space, you find a lot that property management is vertically integrated with the ownership team. You don't see that as much in, in multifamily. There's a, a lot of really good third party options uh, in the mobile home park space. <laughs> I think there's a few different reasons why, but there's just not a ton of um, widely available property management companies. And in fact, when I got my first deal under contract, I was like, okay, great. I'm going to find property management. And I called probably 25 different people and they said, absolutely not. <laughs> and then I was like, okay, I really need to figure this out. So you see a lot of people that are vertically integrated from, from management. So I've had really great luck with management. And I think probably part of that is because um, they're part of your group. You know, it's not a third party that you're maybe frustrated with. Um, and I think it's just kind of all about your attitude. You know, I mean, everyone's going to make mistakes. There's always room for improvement. Um, so I, I don't really think about like, hiccups or, oh, this could have been better or whatever. It's just, um, I think that's just more of a mindset thing. Um, but property management experience is super important. Um, I mean, that's what I would say is uh, you can't mess that part up. You know, there's so many rules and regs and every city is so different. You know, there's some cities that, you know, we're nationwide. Some cities are so easy. They just leave you alone. 
let you do your thing. And then you got some cities that are like in your property every day trying to, you know, see if you're going to mess up and do something they can write you up for, or sue you for. So having a good property management team that knows all the rules and the regs, having a good team of people um, to really deal with those situations. Cause there's, you know, property management is the wild west. I mean, there's always crazy <laughs> stuff happening. And in this particular asset class, it's even, I would say, crazier. Um, there's a lot more dumpster fires, you know, literally. Kind of literally dumpster fires that happen. So it's, um, yeah, you got you to gotta have a, a really good, strong property management team to manage these kind of assets. So are the, uh, I'm assuming the areas that are good for mobile home park um, regulations are also good for you know, like single family or multifamily, like kind of landlord friendly areas, but where are y'all seeing and kind of maybe even, you know, kind of focusing on when it comes to areas to actively find these investments in? I think it's more of where we don't focus on. Um, you know, there's a lot of great areas, you know, uh, we don't have, we don't only say, okay, only Georgia and Texas, um, we're really open to a lot of areas because we have the kind of team that can scale and just dive into an area and figure it out. Uh, but there's definitely some areas at this point that are on our hell no list. We <laughs> like a do not invest list. No. Yeah. Do not fly. We will not mess with y'all. We'll let someone else buy that deal. So uh, some of those have been some hard lessons, but we, we've definitely got our no, no list. Can you give us a, a little taste of the no, no list? <laughs> Michigan. We don't love Michigan. It's been somewhat difficult. Um, we don't do California. We don't do New York. Um, we're a little iffy on Illinois and Ohio. Uh, but the rest of them have been great. I mean, we even own, we own a park in Alaska. I mean, so we're super open to, to different areas. Nice. Yeah. What's the kind of looking at y'all's portfolio? What's the, I mean, Alaska is a pretty random one, but are there any ones you look at and you're like, how the heck are we invested in that market? Like, how did we find something there? And how did the you Alaska find one? one is, is the one that I think about that all the time. It's, <laughs> I've never been to it. It's, it was, it's so extreme and remote that um, to do infill. Uh, so infill would be like actually moving homes into the property, um, we had to barge them, you know, <laughs> barge them in, which I don't even know how you do that. And then there's like, you know, super uh, scary remote roads that you have to go down and like the bears are really bad up there, which I, I, I just grew up never being concerned about bears. That was just never on my, my list of things to be worried about. And now I'm like, I'm kind of scared of bears now, you know? You get some um, bear insurance. Yes. And, and, and that property is so unique because it snows. It, it's like a different being on a different planet there. So it was really, it, it was really challenging when we bought that property because um, we didn't know exactly what the snow situation was like up there. Uh, I had never had any experience with snow. I grew up in the South and, um, it's just, a, it's an entirely different world. So we actually have like heavy equipment that we have to use. And we, during the, the snow months, we literally have a guy just out there plowing snow like all day. And um, in fact, it's, it's so much snow that, that with our equipment, we actually go plow other people's roads and almost like a little side snow plowing business. <laughs> so that one, that one was a really strange one. Um, so that one's a little more difficult to, um, you know, manage. I have no experience in snow plowing. So yeah. now you work on the finance side. So tell me a little bit about kind of actually, you know, figuring it, vetting these deals. Like what is, what's a good thing if someone's interested in this avenue of real estate investing, like what are some of the things they need to be looking at whenever they go in to see if the deal even makes sense? Ooh, okay. Mobile home parks can trip you up. Um, underwriting a mobile home park deal is not the same as a multifamily deal. Uh, a few things um, that are really, really important to note is 
lending on mobile home parks, most lenders are not going to lend on income from the homes. So in the mobile home park world, you have lot rent and then you have home rent and they will capitalize the lot rent, but they will not capitalize mobile home park rent or mobile home rent rather. So keep that in mind with lending. Um, if you have a, a property that's 100 percent rentals, you might even have trouble getting a lender to underwrite that deal at all. Um, so I would look for something that's like 20 percent or less rentals. The rest should be tenant owned homes if you want to get some good lending. Um, so they, they'll usually take, you know, a lot rent cap and then they'll do maybe like a fair value of the actual park on home units instead of the income they produce. Um, I don't love that way of analyzing it, but that's the way that banks are going to do it. So, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, age of homes, I think is super important that people don't talk about a lot. When you've got a property that's full of, you know, 1960s homes, you're going to start looking at a lot of costs when they start cycling out. So thinking about demo costs, that could be four to five grand, maybe get a little bit cheaper than that. Um, and then bringing in new homes to infill that, you know, uh, used homes are somewhat difficult to come by these days. So, you know, you could be looking at bringing in a brand new home, setting it up, you know, that could be. 60 to $85,000. So uh, I would definitely work with a very experienced underwriter on the mobile home parks because they are not super simple to underwrite and you don't want to make those huge mistakes. But um, other than that, they're, they're an awesome asset class. Okay. And so, you know, whenever it does come to, you know, evaluating the deal yourself, like what do y'all look for in a deal to make, you know, you know what, this is something that we should uh, look into. Like, let's say I come to you and I say, show me what deals you have that see if I might be interested in investing in it with you. And if, what do y'all look at to see, yeah, this, this park makes sense. This park doesn't make sense because this is the return we can expect. Like, how do you go about vetting that deal? Uh, obviously returns are everything. So that's, that's one thing. Um, We've, we've started shifting what we're looking at based off experience. Um, we kind of started realizing some of the deep value add properties, you know, maybe like the class D type properties where it appears that there could be a lot of, you know, untapped returns, you know, untapped value. They take a lot of time to turn around and it's, um, it doesn't usually work out the way that your Excel spreadsheet tells you that it's going to work out. If you know what I mean? Uh, the, 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 the people um, can somewhat make it dif difficult. If you have, you know, a property that's D, you know, D class and it's a bunch of angry tenants that, you know, are don't want you to win, you know, they don't realize it's hurting themselves also, but you know, they, they're just battling you. It just makes it really hard. So we've kind of started, shifting our criteria. Um, we've always had like a hundred pad minimum, uh, but we've really started looking at higher quality assets um, because, you know, the, the drain on the management side is so much less, you know, a, a nicer property that's well run, you know, you're not spending, um, you know, you're not having a lot of people having to deal with the dumpster fires, for instance, you know, so we found that there's a, a lot of value in having properties that are a little bit higher, higher end, uh, newer homes. Uh, so that's kind of what we've recently started shifting towards. When when you run your own, um, you know, talking about vetting and as you ran your own and as you built your, you mentioned how, you know, most of them are vertically integrated, like I'm assuming yours is at this point. Do you then have to become like a a business owner of the um, you know of the mobile home park, but then also a property management business owner as well, and kind of the the two fronts? And how did you build your own business doing that? I mean, I know you said you found the one guy, but just having one person doesn't seem like it could solve everything. So how did how have you gone about continuing to build that up as you need to do repairs or replacements or anything like that? Like how have you? managed to continue to run that business 
while also having, you know, <laughs> your real business, your job that you have uh, with the ODC? Um, well, so with with my deal, you know, he had his own property management company. So, you know, I always recommend even if you're vertically integrated, you have two separate legal entities. One should be your management company and then one should be your ownership legal entity. Uh, but but for my personal deal, um, we happen to buy a really great property. Uh, there's a little bit of infill that we've done. Um, we've done some sewer work and, and some other things, but it's it's pretty quiet. It's a pretty quiet property. There's not a lot of effort that's needed um, outside of just the regular property management day to day. So it doesn't take up much of my time. That's kind of what I was looking for is something, you know, very passive. Um, and then on the, the, the ODC side, you know, again, we've got our, we're vertically integrated, but we have our own management company and we, we make sure we're very disciplined about making sure like we run it very separately. You know, this is the management company and then this is the ownership entity. And that becomes super important too when you're dealing with um, issues you know, the, you know, the media loves to make up stories, sensationalize stories. And um, so it's really important that you make that distinction. Here's my management company. And then here's the ownership company. Uh, because, you know, if for if for whatever reason, the news media wants to get a hold of you and say, you're an evil landlord for charging people rent, or whatever they like to say, you know, that they're not going after your holding company, which may own a bunch of other properties. Um, they might find you and say, well, look at you and your nice house, you know, you're greedy and you're stealing from people, you know, so trying to avoid those potential issues. So we, we try to keep our management company as the management company, and then we have the ownership separate. And so if I'm an investor coming to look at the one door capital situation, kind of like, I know, you know, people think of, you know, in general, you know what you can get with, uh, you know, returns on single families. A lot of people kind of know what they can get on returns with like apartment complexes. What kind of, I know you focus on immediate cash flow for investors, but what kind of returns do mobile home parks in general return for people? I really don't think I could answer that question. That's so all over the board. And it, it really depends on timing too, because like back in 2018, you could have bought any mobile home park and had a slam dunk. Um, now it, they've caught on very quickly. Everyone's kind of become pretty hip to the mobile home park world. And it's, um, it's no longer unsexy. It's now very sexy, the mobile home park. So it, it just really depends. You got to buy it right though. I'm a huge believer in buying something right. I do not like overpaying for stuff. Um, I'm pretty old school in that way. So mm -hmm. Uh, but it's so hard to say what the returns are. Um, and, you know, the other thing to, to bring up is it depends on who your investor, what their, your investor avatar is, you know, um, it is, uh, you know, we have a fund structure. So we've got with, within a fund, we, we purchase multiple properties. So depending on what kind of fund that we want to offer, we might have a different profile for the asset that we want to put in that fund. So, we could have an investor that just wants to make, you know, 5%, but it's safe, you know, as opposed to some investors, you know, they want to, you know, they're the the Vegas slot machine people and hey, let me throw a hundred, you know, to make a hundred. So it just depends on appetite of the investor. Um, most of our investor base are accredited investors. They're looking for um, more of a, a long-term um, hold and appreciation, uh, not necessarily uh, higher cash on cash returns on the front end. So that's mostly been our model. Okay. And is most of the appreciation come, I assume, from um, kind of upgrading you know, gas lines or power lines and those amenities in the area, um, replacing units with newer mobile homes that, that you're gonna have on your own lot? Or is that where you force the appreciation or how does that come into play? There's, there's a, a lot of things. This is why I like this asset class. There's a lot of things you can do to get appreciation. Um, obviously, the, the, the number one thing, right, is raise rents. 
you know, every, everybody in the real estate game knows that. I, that's, that goes without even uh, mentioning. Well, let, me, let me take note. That's an important thing. I need <laughs> to remember my next property. <laughs> um, uh, the other cool thing is, is bringing in homes and selling them. So uh, let's take, for instance, let's say you have a park that has an empty lot and it's not bringing in any money. The, the cap on it is almost zero. You could probably give it like a little bit of value for having some infrastructure there. Um, but if you were to buy, let's say, let's say you found an awesome home for $15,000 on Craigslist, you go buy it, you move it. That's another four or 5,000. You set it up, maybe another 2,000. So I don't know, maybe you're at like 20, 22,000 cost to bring in a new home. And now you're going to charge, uh, I don't know, $300, $350 a month lot rent on this home. And a lot of operators will sell uh, these homes on um, like a, a lease to own or rent to own agreement, depending on what the state allows. And so those kind of have a uh, like a face value almost. So you could say, um, you know, I'll sell you this home for $30,000. You know, you could pay me today or you can pay me, you know, $500 a month for the next 60 months. I don't know if the math works out. Yeah. Don't check me on that. But uh, <laughs> but you, you get the idea. And a brief so, option for, for, the, for the people. So if you think about it, if you take that lot rent cap, so let's say we did $300 a month, you know, whatever that is off a of six cap. Um, so I don't know, $50,000, $60,000. And then now you've, you've created a, a loan, a note that you could, that has value, right? If, if you, you're basically saying, if you, if you ever sold the property, like, um, here's a, here's a home on there. This guy's supposed to pay $30,000, you know, over the course of five years that has value. So now you've got lot rent and you've got a note, slap those together. That's a double whammy for, um, appreciation, right. you know? Right. So do you have any other tips for people looking to, to force appreciation? on any, uh, as they're looking into one of these deals or thinking about it themselves? Hmm. I mean, th those to me are the, are the, are the two biggest levers, yeah. um, making sure, uh, you know, I, I guess the next level down from that would be making sure all your bill backs are good. You know, what's your, uh, what's your recapture on your, your utilities? You know, are you billing back for trash? Could you, should you, you know, just really kind of digging through all those expenses, you know, what makes sense to bill back to the tenants? Because um, I, I feel like some people don't really pay attention to, to that. You know, are you charging fees? Are you charging pet fees? Um, yeah, just just kind of getting a little creative on making sure your bill backs are in order and any any additional interesting billings that, that you could do that makes sense. All right. Well, is there anything else you think our investors uh, and listeners should know before we wrap it up here today? I do. I want to tell um, I want to tell you guys about an awesome thing that uh, Brandon Turner just launched. I'm super excited about it. Um, he launched. Uh, he, it, there's going to be a new podcast called A Better Life or Better Life, and he's launching um, a tribe, which is going to be similar to like a mastermind. Um, a very affordable mastermind. So um, if you go to, uh, what is it? A, a better life tribe.com. What is so exciting about this is not only is it going to uh, give the opportunity to, you know, uh, mentor and, and, and uh, meet with like-minded people and uh, you'll get content or get access to content from like really good speakers, world renowned speakers, um, and the best part about it is 100% of the profits go to uh, fight or they, yeah, they, they go to help end human trafficking, which is, um, you know, everyone throws around that term a lot. I encourage everyone dig into what that really means because it's a huge deal for our world and more people right now are enslaved than they ever have been. And so I'm super passionate about that. And uh, so it's it's a what I would call a triple win. You know, people that join it get to win by getting excellent um, content, and then we get to help um, you know people change their lives by removing them from human trafficking. So 
it's a really awesome uh, thing that, that, that he's doing. So I encourage you guys to go check that out. All right. Well, thank you so much again. Sydney is the vice president of finance at Open Door Capital. You can find them at odcfund.com. That's odcfund.com. She just mentioned uh, Brandon Turner's a better life tribe.com. That's a better life tribe.com. Don't forget to check us out at renttoretirement.com where you can see all the properties we have as well as schedule a time to talk with us about your investment journey specifically. That's at renttoretirement.com. For more educational content, you can also find us on YouTube at youtube.com slash rent to retirement. That's youtube.com slash rent to retirement. Please leave us a review on whatever podcast platform you utilize. If you leave a review and send us a screenshot of that, we'll send you a $10 gift card and enter you in a raffle to win a $500 closing cost credit, which will be drawn at the end of June, 2023. You can send those pictures to podcasts at rent to retirement.com. That's podcast at renttoretirement.com. Thank you so much for listening and watching, and we'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos, like this one, or this one here.